Hello, everybody. Um, I think we might as well get started. It looks like most people are in the room or getting their food or finding their seats. So um, we can get started. Um, please let me know if it's been so long since I did this in real life. Please let me know if uh, you can't hear me or something. Um, hello to my friends from the government of Japan. I see you there. <laughs> um, so thank you again for coming. This is my this is the first uh, event in this corporate governance series this academic year. And uh, it's my first time to be uh, speaking in this building. Uh, so I'm very excited, and I hope you are too. Um, so we're here. There, is, there are several questions that are eternal, right, that we need to find the answer for. And one of them is, is the Japanese business environment really changing? And if so, is this being reflected in the prices in the stock market. Uh, I can see that there aren't many people in this room who don't already know this, but for decades, the equity prices of leading Japanese companies have traded at a very deep discount relative to their global peers. And even today, many listed companies trade at a market cap which is less than the value of their cash and liquid assets. Think about that for a minute. Many of them trade below book value, signaling that investors expect them to destroy value, not to create it. And there are some people, um, I have a Columbia classmate that many people in this room may know, David Barron, uh, who founded Symphony Financial Partners in Japan. He says that the low valuations of companies in Japan is a function of a broken stock market, not of the individual companies in it. And there are several pieces to this argument. One is that there are simply too many listed companies, and that the majority of them are not accountable to shareholders. And therefore, the low valuations of these companies drag down the entire value of the Japanese stock market, including the value of the minority of companies who are truly dynamic. Japan, like most developed economies, is dominated by passive asset management funds who are investing to match an index. So the predominance of badly managed companies in the market index is a penalty for the well-managed ones. The second piece of the argument is that there has never been a market for corporate control in Japan. We're fortunate to have Tim Foley here with us today to focus on this question. Entrenched managements of older Japanese companies have been protected by the lifetime employment system, by a persistent system of cross shareholdings, by boards of directors, which continue to be dominated by insiders, and by weak stewardship of investors in Japan. Both foreign and Japanese fund managers still seem to be hesitant to question managements of companies whose shares they hold. Prime Minister Abe was the first politician to try to attack this problem head on. During his administration, many landmark policies were announced. We have both the Corporate Governance Code and the Stewardship Code, which were issued. Both were attempts to hold companies and asset managers more accountable for the return on their investments. And in 2014, the GPIF, Government Pension Investment Fund of Japan, with more than $1.2 trillion under management, announced it was reducing its 60% asset weighting in JGBs to 40% and reinvesting those funds in equities. So you had that change as well. Plans for a reform of listing requirements for companies on the Tokyo Stock Exchange were also initiated under Abe. And another important measure was the publication of the so-called Fair M&A Rules, which set new standards for protection of rights of minority shareholders. And finally, just last year, the tax code was amended to allow for tax-free treatments of corporate spin-offs. This tax change was meant to encourage companies to get rid of non-core assets. And we've yet, I think, to see a single company uh, take advantage of that new measure. There was some discussion at Toshiba a year ago, but nothing came of it. So on paper, all of these initiatives seem to have produced some results. Never have Japanese boards been composed of so many diverse and independent directors. Shareholder proposals to Japanese companies reached record levels this year, 
although very few of them succeeded. And as Tim will show us, the number of friendly and unfriendly attempts to alter control of Japanese companies have also reached record levels. But again, few have succeeded. And first of all, I want to say um, I regard criticism of Japan as a form of love. We all want to see Japan be the best it can be. And it is frustrating to see um, a complete lack of appetite for substantial change. So I do want to give Japan credit for making these changes, which I appreciate have been very difficult and very uncomfortable. And it is true that board discussions have become much more strategic, much less about checking any boxes. Returns to shareholders are now a regular item on the board meeting agendas of most companies. However, a functioning system of governance depends less on org charts and more on the attitude of the CEO and the chairman towards outsiders. If the CEO and the chairman are genuinely interested in responding to suggestions and questions from outsiders, whether they be investors, creditors, independent directors, or NGOs, then the structure of committees, the type of independent directors, the composition of the board will not be so critical. However, if the CEO and the chairman refuse to engage with others, it really doesn't matter how many independent directors surround the chairman or the CEO, governance is going to fail. And so my concern about governance in Japan is that it still seems nearly impossible to remove such people from the organization. And I'd like to turn the discussion over to Tim now to hear how this uh, situation is changing. But before I do that, um, I do want to say um, Tim and I have known each other for a long time. We talk about this topic all the time. And so it's very, we're going to have a fun conversation. Um, you're welcome to hold your questions till the end. You're also welcome to raise your hand and ask, ask a question at any time. The only thing I would ask, uh, you've heard this a million times, is if you have a question to ask, uh, state your name and your affiliation, whether you're a B-School student or somebody else, and make it a question and not a speech or a rant or a complaint. Um, great. I'm going to take my seat. Tim, I should say, um, hello? Is it, is it on? Yeah, OK. Sorry? OK. Uh, so um, I knew Tim from his time at a family officer who was in charge of allocating funds to Japanese activist managers. And he has recently, recently decided to take a big risk because of a belief that he holds very passionately about the prospect of change in Japan. And uh, I will turn it over to him to say a few words about what he's doing and why he's doing it. Sure, thanks. Um, thanks for coming, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to um, support CJEB. And I've, I've gained so much over the years from your introductions and from sitting in on sessions like this. So I'm happy to be here. Um, I recently launched a business where um, we're not activists ourselves, but we believe that um, activism in Japan can generate can generate alpha. And so we invest with activist managers. We invest in the stocks that activists own. Um, we think that uh, in, in the world of factor investing, it, it's one factor that hasn't really been commoditized yet. And so we, we try to align ourselves with um, interesting and forward-thinking shareholder activists in Japan. Um, I focus on this market because it's it's a it's a dream for value investors. Um, there's, you know, as 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 you mentioned in your opening comments, there's you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies that that trade at um, at valuations that are unseen anywhere else in the world. Um, Japan has, I think, is 850 companies that trade at a price to book ratio of 0 0.7 or less, uh, which which is more than any market in the world by by a wide margin. Uh, you mentioned there's a few hundred companies that trade at negative enterprise values. Um, so uh, it's a great starting point for, for value investing. And I think that there's a lot of tailwinds uh, for, for shareholder activism. And uh, my experience just happened to line up with what I thought was a really good opportunity set. Um, and so I thought it was a great time to kind of go all in uh, on this. 
Yeah, so uh, you mentioned that this is a dream for value investors because there's so many companies. Or a nightmare, yeah. <laughs> well, it's sort of like, uh, what, do, what do people always used to say about Brazil? It's got the greatest potential and always will. I mean, <laughs> that's the question about Japan, right? So why are you talking about buyouts today? Why are we talking about buyouts today? And what is the evidence that you see that things are beginning to change and that value can be unlocked? Sure. So um, I think before we should take a step back and, and uh, define the problem, which, which you addressed also, is uh, Japan has too many publicly traded companies. Um, too many of them are very, very cheap. Um, and that's a problem for a lot of reasons, which we, which we can get into. Um, I think there's societal issues. There's issues with the labor market. There's issues with financial markets. Um, but but this, this is the issue. Yeah, if I can interrupt you. Sure. There's too many companies, as you said, and they're too cheap, they're too small, and there's too many of them for the industry to um, research, to put it mildly. Sure, the securities I, industry. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so there's no real good source of outside evaluation of so many listed Japanese companies. Yes, a lot of them have little to no analyst coverage, um, uh, you know, little to no engaged shareholders, so yeah, agree, totally agree. Um, so, so uh, that's that's been a big problem for Japan, and, and the exchange has tried to, to try to address it. Uh, the government of Japan has tried to address it. The, the proxy advisors around the world have tried to address it. Um, and I, I think it's it, things are moving slowly. Um, it, it's a problem because it creates apathy. Uh, it creates apathy amongst international investors. It creates apathy amongst domestic investors. Um, I think it. It, to a certain extent, it can create deflation. If there's too many companies and none are allowed to fail, there's downward price pressure. Um, it creates issues with, with labor mobility and labor markets. So um, it's not just, you know, some pension funds aren't making enough money. I think there's, there's real problems with having, you know, what you can, you can say is a, is, a, is a part of the stock market's broken, right? Um, you have 800 companies that trade at some ridiculously low valuation. Um, as you said in your opening comments, it's either you know, it's either the companies or the market. I think it's a combination of both. Um, you mentioned some, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah, yeah. you. You mentioned something that, he, that Tim and I were speaking about before this, about why there are so many listed Japanese companies. Yeah. And uh, it, it, in our discussion, we were commenting that a lot of it is societal, that um, Japanese CEOs seem to feel that being a listed company is the only way to attract good graduates from best universities. Um, I would also say something we didn't talk about. But back when I was an analyst in Tokyo in the bubble era, uh, it was kind of a racket, which is a number of the brokerage companies would approach uh, a private company and say to the CEO, we will list you, you will be rich. Yeah, right? Sure. And, and, then, and then we'll manage your money for you. We'll put it in real estate, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. which turned out to be not a good idea. But this whole idea that you need to be a listed company for prestige yes. and to attract good graduates, I was thinking about how I could ask the question in the room. I think in America, to the extent that graduates from Columbia Business School <coughs> or elsewhere are making any calculation about where to work based on stock, they're either thinking about getting paid in stock, right? Or, as Tim pointed out to me, you want to work for a startup so that when the payoff in your stock holding happens, it happens really big time. Whereas I don't think that this, that's not the calculation in Japan because nobody in Japan except for a few top executives get paid in stock. Um, but can I just ask with a show of hands, does the factor of stock, when you're thinking about joining company A or company B, does it filter into your calculations at all? Yes, no. OK, <laughs> a few shy hands. Yeah. Getting um, compensated in options for, for future value. Yeah, so yeah. I think a lot in the US, we had this idea that you join a startup, and when the company goes public, you exit. And you go right. to the next startup. <laughs> right. And the, the prestige of a public listing is not so much. Right. The prestige of a startup that's being well-funded and backed by good venture capitalists. Um, but it's definitely a, a thing in Japan, right, that you have to be a listed company in order to attract good staff. And I don't know that there's any proof yeah. of that. Yeah. Some people will, tell, will say yes. Yeah, some people will say no. Um, there's also the, the history of um, a big conglomerates spinning off individual business units. Um, uh, and that's, again, that's somewhat employee retention, I think. Um, in a system of lifetime employment, you need a place for um, accomplished executives who aren't going to run the mothership to be, to be placed. So you create spinoffs, and, and then you can have a CEO of that company, a CEO of that company, 
Um, this has created a whole, you know, parent subsidiary, all the publicly listed subsidiaries in Japan, which, which is another separate issue. Um, uh, but, but so back to your question, you said on, on uh, the evidence of change. So, so there is some evidence of change. Um, uh, you can look at uh, a few different metrics. One is the number of delistings. So um, the, the, uh, the exchange has had an increasing number of stocks uh, being taken off the exchange for, for any number of reasons. I, I can almost guarantee that very, very few of them are for bankruptcies uh, because just bankruptcies don't really happen that much in Japan. Um, so the delistings are happening from either parent subsidiary consolidations or, or management buyouts or, or takeovers, um, uh, you know, go private transactions with private equity funds. Um, so so that, that's on the rise. Uh, 2021 was a record year for delistings. There's 86 delistings uh, in, in the past, you know, in the past decade or so. Um, can, can we hear from your point of view, again, what is the major factor? So the Tokyo Stock Exchange just announced new rules. Yes. And if you want to be in the golden section or whatever, prime section, you know, you have to meet certain standards. Is this why companies are delisting? Because they can't meet them? I've heard stories about companies not wanting to be bothered to meet them. Yeah. Um, I suppose it's also a big commitment in terms of expense to produce the kinds of reports that you need um, and there's succession issues. So w what are the major factors in these delistings, do you think? So the, the parent subsidiary situation is pretty consistent. There's something like between 10 and 30 parent subsidiary transactions per year. That's, that's been a pretty consistent pace since around 2014 or so. Um, so that's, that hasn't changed that much. Um, I'd say it's, it's, it's probably a little bit stronger. Um, uh, M&A is up, right? So there's more M&A happening. Um, uh, I think part of that is, because as you mentioned, there's this future pressure around what it means to be a listed company in Japan. Um, uh, my partner puts it well where uh, he says that the, there are clear benefits to being a listed company and it shouldn't be free. And so in the past, it's kind of been free to be yes. listed. Yes. Um, the, the exchange is pretty much saying, well, now you have to, maybe not expense in terms of dollars and cents, but you have to try to be a listed company. You're going to have to put some effort forth to stay listed, uh, whether that means increasing your free float or increasing the number of independent directors. Or publishing um, reports in English. Publishing reports in English, right. Um, so, sh so certainly some companies are probably looking at that and saying, well, you know, we, we were a, uh, you know, take a random case, right, there's a, there's a refinery, uh, oil refinery, and, and it was spun off from a parent company years ago, and it's one single refinery, right? Mm -hmm. It's just one structure uh, on the Tokyo Bay, and um, that should be part of a bigger conglomerate. Should they have all the expense and overhead of being a publicly listed company and have to worry about their shareholders? And um, it should probably just be part of a conglomerate, and, and those ones are being consolidated back in. So if it's the company that I'm thinking of, it has been under attack by an activist, right? Until two days ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the idea. a few of those like that, yeah. Right, right. The, the idea was, it's like, what are you doing? You know, being a, a publicly traded company right. on your own, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, but not so many of these transactions have ended happily. Um, in my sort of observation, this problem is really a specifically Japanese problem, where you have a parent company who has decided to list several divisions for reasons, as Tim explained, you need to have a place for a seasoned executive to retire as CEO uh, or whatever. Um, and because that it's now appreciated that is not a good thing, uh, a number of companies are trying to reconsolidate. Yes. But uh, minority shareholder rights in Japan is not the thing that Japan should be most proud of, let me put it that way. Well, the, the rights are there. On paper, the minority share, the rights are very strong. Maybe. They're, uh, they're, they're there. Uh, it's just yeah. the ability to exercise them. I exactly. Think. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, there which, are a number yeah. of, of activists who are kind of playing that card, yes. right? Whether it's Murakami or Mr. Fisher who get involved specifically in transactions where a parent company is making a bid for its subsidiary, and these guys come in and say, no, 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 no that price is not high enough. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it, and 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 it happens a lot, and, and you know, it, I think it's it's a there's a very wide um, uh, there's, there's a big difference between what the parent company thinks something is worth versus the investor. The investor looks at the assets that they're entitled to based on owning shares of that company and says, well, the land is worth a billion dollars and the refinery is worth this much, and the parent company says, well, we're not going to shut down the refinery and build condos. So for us, the land is there's no right. The land is only worth how much we can take out of the refinery. Um, 
So this, this to me is a classic case of a company that should be consolidated because if they're not going to maximize the value of the assets, it shouldn't be a publicly traded company, right? Um, it, sh it should be part of a larger conglomerate where they can maximize the value of the assets. Um, so anyway, so back, so the evidence of change, right? So we talked about uh, uh, the number of delistings are, it's on the rise, it's kind of at an all time high. Um, publicly traded subsidiaries continue to be delisted at kind of between 10 and 30 per year. I think there's about 200 remaining now, publicly traded subs. Um, tender offers, which, which, which we'll talk more about, um, that's in really uh, dynamic space. There's, I think, 70 or so tender offers in 2021, which is, again, a relative high uh, for the past decade or so. Yeah, back in like 1990, there weren't any, right? <laughs> yeah, well, there, there, have been, there have been tender no. offers, but, it, but it, they've all like been pre-negotiated and not, not too exciting. Um, and, then, and then what's really interesting is, is uh, hostile or unsolicited bids. So uh, over the past three years, it's been about an average of 10 per year. Um, five on average have been like successful uh, for, for hostile TOBs. Um, and some real, like some real notable ones. Uh, we've had a hostile takeover, at least on paper, a hostile takeover of regional bank, which is a, a huge development. There's been successful hostile takeovers by activist investors, which is almost inconceivable. And then an increasing trend of, uh, you know, List, you know, Japanese listed co to Japanese listed co hostile takeovers. To me, um, this is one of the really underappreciated stories that when people read headlines about uh, hostile takeovers in Japan, you know, the assumption is it's some, you know, old time villain from the United States, Gordon yeah. Gecko, but in fact, it's Nippon Steel or, right. Right. <laughs> or Itochu or, you know, some old timey Japanese company which is making a bid for a competitor or, you know, somebody they see undervalued. Um, and it makes total sense that they're the ultimate winners because they're the ones who have the most synergies with those assets, right? So they should be the ones, I mean, they should be the ones who win. They should be, they should have, uh, they should be the best buyers, is a phrase I like to use. They, they should be the, they should pay the highest price because they probably have the most synergies. They probably know the assets better. The assets maybe used to be part of their company, right? Right. They probably are, it's either a supplier or a customer that they're looking to consolidate. So, um, really, the I think uh, the, the 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 in you know they they call it in in M and A, right? Um, from Japan to Japan, listed co to listed co. Um, that's where I think we'll see the most increase in uh, in deals. Yeah, it's interesting to speculate why this is happening now because until just a few years ago. You know, everybody agreed to play in their own backyard yeah. and not throw garbage over the fence, for lack of a better metaphor, right? It's like you minded your own business and you let your competitor in the same industry have his relationships with his traditional clients and you had yours and everybody was happy. But that, it seems like the gloves are coming off. And yes. as I was listening to you, um, one idea just occurred to me, probably some of it has to do with the breakdown of Zaibatsu's. Right, which has been happening since the late 1990s, so that you know the group uh, affiliation and the group loyalty is not there anymore. But what other reasons do you see? Is it global competition? Is it competition from China? Is it the rise of foreign shareholders? What is what's breaking down that um, societal agreement to not make trouble for each other? Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think it's the. Sorry, I don't think it's the rise of foreign shareholders. I don't think there is a rise in foreign shareholders. I think. <laughs> well, right after Abe, there was this wave. Right? There was after Abe came into power. There was this huge, is like a twenty or thirty trillion yen net inflow for four years, and then that immediately all reversed back out. Uh, twenty twelve to twenty sixteen, it came in. Twenty sixteen to twenty twenty one, I think it came all back out. I think we're back at level. I think we're back at net inflows of around where Abe took power. Uh, um, so, so, so why is it happening? I, there, there's, a, there's a few reasons, um, not the least of which I think is a more engaged uh, shareholder base um, who are demanding better returns on equity and, um, uh, and better shareholder returns. Um, Foreign shareholders, domestic shareholders, both? Both, but, but um, this is something that you've always talked about is where you saw this list of priorities for a typical Japanese CEO and foreign shareholders are at the bottom, right, uh, historically. Um, I think what's really the big change is that it's domestic shareholders. Mm. Um, it's domestic activists. Um, it, it's easy to paint a foreign activist as someone who you know, flies in on their jet and comes in and steals the money and goes away. Um, the domestic activists, they live in town. They ride the bus. They go to lunch at the same places they do. So it, you, can't, you can't make this story of, um, of these terrible foreigners coming in to, to you know, pillage and, and take, uh, take from Japan. It's, it's domestic investors who are demanding more. It's GPIF who's demanding more, right? Um, 
they're asking their asset managers to, to, to vote and, you know, vote consciously and vote with the proxy advisors. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I don't want to yeah. interrupt you, but I want to mention that, you know, one of my friends, Oki Matsumoto, who owns, who's established Monex, when he started his activist fund, this was his point. Yes. He says his clients are retail investors and they are not Gordon Gecko. They are, you know, they're, they're looking after themselves in their own country. They're not looking to yeah. strip assets. Yeah. And one of the investment um, activists that you and I both admire, Mr. Maruki of Strategic Capital, I consider him a patriot. You know, he's sure. he's in there sticking his neck out because he wants to see Japan do better. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if you agree, but to me, that's also part of the story is that there's this awakening in Japan that the Japanese standard of living and wages and dynamism of the, of the economy is kind of slipping. Sure, yeah, I, mean, I think that's been going on for a long time, right? Um, I think the other, the other factors that are that are kind of at play now are that there's uh, cross shareholdings are, are coming down. Like these are like the pillars, I've had this analogy, is like the, the pillars that have enabled entrenched management to stay in power and to ignore shareholders in the past. Cross shareholdings, uh, takeover defense, and you know, a board stocked with insiders from either the parent company or, right? Um, those pillars are kind of crumbling little by little. Cross shareholdings are, are, re, are reducing. It's starting at the large caps, but they're selling off mid caps and eventually get to the mid caps or selling off small caps, right? Um, the, the number of poison pills every year is lower. Um, uh, companies putting poison pills in place. Um, and, and as we know, the number of independent directors is just, uh, I think, almost 100% almost of companies yeah. on, on the first section now have yeah. have two or three independent directors. Yeah, you and I, I think have different attitudes about that. I, 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 I don't like to generalize, but I think most independent directors in Japan are pretty ineffectual, uh, partly because there's no training for directors, partly because many directors, as we talked about, um, overboarding is a huge issue in Japan. I mean, I know tons of people who are on five or six boards all the time. And you have that in America too, but the big difference between America and Japan on the, in the problem of overboarding is that in America, boards meet four times a year. In Japan, they meet once a month. If you've got to attend five or six board meetings every month and you probably have another job, it's kind of difficult to imagine how somebody can be effective. And again, my final point, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, is it really is up to the CEO. You can have a board made up completely of independent directors. I may have told you this anecdote, yeah. but I once hosted a CEO of a high-tech <clears throat> company who bragged to the audience that his entire board was made of independence and that he worked for them, they could fire him any time, which is true. But then somebody in the audience said, hmm, you're a high-tech company and none of your directors has any background in technology at all. And the guy said, yeah, so I can do whatever I want. <laughs> I mean, so again, the whole concept of independent directors is based on the assumption that the chairman and the CEO want to work with independent directors and that there is a supply of qualified independent directors who are there to do their best job. Agreed. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Agreed, <laughs> agreed. You mentioned the um, quick about turn of foreign investors after yeah. Abe first announced <coughs> his economic policies known as the three arrows. Yes. What do you think that was about? Um, I think rightfully so. There's a ton of enthusiasm when, when Abe came into power and, and launched, um, launched his three arrows program. Um, and, and just simply that enthusiasm kind of waned. Um, uh, there, you know, there was there was a lot of chatter up front. Uh, Japan was cheap, is cheap. People rushed in. Um, the the changes that the government put into place, which I actually really appreciate, and and, and I think I think was was wise long term. Is uh, it really it puts the onus on shareholders to, to make the change. Um, the government put in very few rules. They put in more guidelines. Um, we think you should have this many outside directors. If you don't, that's fine, but you have to explain why, right? This is this concept of comply or explain. And I think that I think that, that was a smart way to do it, but it's certainly not the fastest way to get things done. Um, and so I think people got impatient. At the same time, you had, you know, Japan is a low growth market, right? And so if there's not growth, there has to be something else, a big catalyst for investors to, to keep paying attention. If that catalyst isn't there, then they're gonna look elsewhere, right? Every other market, in, well, not every other market, a lot of the other markets in Asia are, are high growth markets, or at least were back in 2012, right? So people were very busy allocating to um, China and Vietnam and um, all the other uh, East, South or East Asian countries. Um, Japan, as it has many times in the past, just kind of fell to the wayside. 
Uh, I think people took their money back out. They made a little bit of money and said, oh, maybe this is it, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is another false start. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think it was another false start. I think, I think people got a little bit over their skis. Mm -hmm. And um, I, think, I think, you know, the changes are, they were happening slowly. And now I think there's more and more momentum behind them. Yeah, um, I, I agree with you. I mean, uh, I, I'd really love to hear from people in the audience who might have questions or comments. But to me, it really does seem like this time is different. Um, and I think part of it has to do with the fact that this really is a, a moment of, I don't know what the right expression is, put up or shut up, or do or die, or it's really to the overused word existential. It's an existential moment in Japan. You know, why does the company, why does the country still have eight car companies? That's <laughs> insane. There's no country in the world who has that. And so in order to be able to feed its own market effectively and feed the pension fund uh, returns effectively and compete globally, and Japan is going to have to embrace um, new attitudes and new ideas. Um, so um, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, um, You've long been involved with at least one activist fund that focuses on very small cap companies. Sure. Uh, I'm on the board of two activist funds where this is the focus on small and at best mid cap companies. This space is on fire. You know, it's like we get another portfolio company suggested to our fund every other day. And when we invest, we find there's at least two or three other activists on the shareholder register. Yeah. So people are all, and again, it seems like people are making a fortune, hello out there, Columbia Business School, making a fortune in activism and small and mid-cap Japanese companies. But I also am a consultant to one of the biggest activist funds in the world, and they couldn't care about Japan at all. <laughs> and this is what I see, is that big activist funds um, don't have the patience or the appetite to get involved with big Japanese companies, which I think is a shame. Yeah. Because it's the big companies that really need to change. Why do you think that's so? Why aren't uh, engaged shareholders uh, or activists uh, being more demanding of the big companies that they invest in? Well, I think they have been. I think the changes that we've talked about so far, the, the number of outside directors, the cross shareholdings, um, a lot of that has occurred at the large cap level. And um, large cap companies have more independent directors, more international directors. Um, they look better on paper. They probably have higher ROEs than a lot of the companies we're talking about. So if you think about, and, and you switch your mindset to small cap companies, a lot of these are the examples that you gave, which is a company trading below its cash, right? Uh, the market cap is less than the cash on the balance sheet. Um, Large cap companies are, it, it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time. There it takes could, a lot of there money. There could be government meddling, right? A lot, lot of money. For, for a smaller cap company, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty easy suggestion. You say your, your stock is trading at less than the cash on your balance sheet, that's a problem, you need to change it. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't take that much time to express that to the management team. Whereas for large cap companies, we're talking about reorganizing businesses and closing this division, opening this division, investing in these markets. It's, it's much more of an engagement, um, uh, long-term engagement uh, uh, that, that, you know, that could frankly take a lot, a lot of time. And case in point is Toshiba, that, that activism case has been going on for years, and it's turned out well for some of the investors, but it has not been quick or easy or without its fair share of headaches. Um, uh, in the small <laughs> That's cap, putting it mildly. Yeah, in, in the small cap space, there's, and the other thing is there, there's hundreds of targets. I, I, I keep coming back to this number. There's over 800 companies that traded a price to book of less than 0 0.7, mm. 800. Mm. So your, your choices are just, I mean, if you're, if you're a smaller fund who can deploy capital in a smaller cap name, um, you, you just have hundreds and hundreds of choices to choose from. Not every single one is a great target for sure. Um, but again, this idea that if a, if a company is trading at 0 0.7 price to book, uh, either, either the market is, thinks that they're gonna destroy value um, or there's some sort of hidden asset there. That, or they that, are, and you can help them. Or they are, yeah. So, so either way, it's something that you should be paying attention to. Yeah, uh, and again, it's a problem, right? just to make the point for this room, I mean, it's not just Tim and I. Probably three-quarters of the people in this room could go over and buy a Japanese small company. I mean, yeah. market cap is, you know, 
their company's trading for like a million bucks or something. Yeah, right? there's some there's yeah. some that are super small. We're, super we're, small, right? Yeah, we're mostly focused on. Uh, I, I, know, that kind I know. I know. I'm just one, making the point. But yeah, there are a lot of really small. That ones, yeah. um, for a, for an activist, a big activist fund who has 65 billion dollars to invest, they can't screw around with companies like this. They have to take on Panasonic or Nissan or whoever it is. And my experience has been that not only does the government have feelings about it, but the domestic shareholder base who might be very happy to push for change at a tiny Japanese company is not going to do that yeah. for a global Japanese corporate brand. Part of it also comes to the, to the I'd say, the, um, some of the problems of running an activist strategy. Um, an activist strategy, people, your investors expect you to usually be fully invested. Um, and if you have success, you'll gain more assets and you'll want to You'll, you'll, sorry, not you want to, you'll be forced to take on bigger and bigger targets or to increase the number of names in your portfolio. Um, in my experience, uh, a reasonable team of activist investors on, you know, in one fund can probably really do two to three campaigns at a time. They're very time consuming. Um, they're expensive. To, 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 you have to have lawyers and advisors, right? Um, so, so you can't really do that many. So, so you have to run a concentrated portfolio. So if, you, if you're successful and you raise more assets, um, you're just forced to move up the market cap scale, um, or you're forced to expand the number of companies in your portfolio, uh, which will dilute your overall returns and probably bring your AUM back to where it was pr previously. Mm -hmm. So there is an issue with, with um, just the structure of, of activist funds globally mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. how they're set up and, and what that enables you to do. Um, a lot of the best targets, I think, are smaller. Mm -hmm. and so I don't think that, to me, activism in Japan is not a with rare, rare exception, um, it's not a $10 billion strategy. Um, it's a couple hundred million dollar strategy. And you just keep recycling that capital to interesting names. That, mm -hmm. that, that's, our, that's our idea. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't prepare you this for this question, so apologies if I'm catching you off guard. But I remember a fund manager who I was, who's not an activist, who was asking me about some of the work I do. And he said to me, why would you invest in a bad company? Why don't you just invest in a good company and make it better? It's like, how would you answer that question? So I think investing is all about valuation. It, right, so there's a lot of great companies, but if they're priced as a great company, then there's not much opportunity um, for an activist, especially. Um, there, there's levels of uh, badness that, are, that I think are acceptable for most activist investors. So, I think activist investors screen for a company that is cash generative, that is not losing money. Um, they, they want to verify the, um, right, the validity of the assets. They want to visit the, the sites. They want to know that what's on the books is, is real. Mm -hmm. um, but if a company is trading at you know, half of book value, for example, or even 0 0.7 book value, let's just say that. Let's say it's trading at two-thirds of book value. If you can bring that company to book value over the course of two years, it's roughly 50% upside, it's a good return. That, yeah. that, that's 20, 25% per year, that, that's a really good return. Yeah. Um, so the company doesn't need to be growing that much or it doesn't need to be uh, an exceptionally great, whatever the metric you mean by good company. Um, if, it, if it's producing profits and it's stable um, and it's an issue with capital allocation, um, you, know, you can make a decent return by getting the company from two thirds of book value to book value <coughs> and you do that three or four times a year, and that, that's a really good business. Hmm. I think, um, yeah, one of the cases I can remember about what you're saying is um, one of the funds that I, I, I sit on identified a company called Pigeon Japan. Probably a lot of you know it or maybe have even read the case study. So in, in your, to your point about what makes a good company, they produce baby products that were consistently rated the best in the world, and the prices were competitive. But they're selling into Japan. <laughs> where there's no births, right? And so the fund that I was involved with, who, by the way, had been formerly consultants, came in and said, you need a president who can speak English, right. who's worked overseas. Right. And lo and behold, they hired a Japanese guy who worked in Virginia or something, and he developed the China market for them. And their share price kind of like tripled in three years. So it's, yeah, I mean, to your point, there are companies who just need that, Oof, to realize what they're really all about, yep. rather than just stripping out the real estate yeah. or the pension fund or whatever it is. I, I tell my son every morning when we're walking to school, I said, get some pep in your step. Like, <laughs> come on, 
like get up, like move move quickly, act act you know act um, act passionate, and yeah, some some companies just need some pep in their step. Uh, uh, they 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 need they need to think um, about the future. They need to think about sh what shareholders are going to want, um, and you know get after it. I also remember something about this president that I, I want to ask you to comment on because we we talked about some Japanese companies even this late in the day refuse to meet investors full stop, yeah. or they refuse to meet with certain types of investors, or certain investors who are not Japanese. In other words, you know, they don't want to talk to people who scare them, or who they fear they may not know how to react to. So this particular president, um, I remember he said to me that he regarded his role as that of an innkeeper, that he had to welcome everybody who came in the door and understand that some people would stay for a long time, some people would stay for a short time, some people would leave and come back, whatever. But I just thought that was a really lovely analogy yeah. and showed exactly how he regarded his responsibility towards shareholders. Yeah, I, I would add even not only innkeeper, but um, uh, a sense of duty to the shareholders as well. Right, and that, that's, that's what a public listing entails. Mm. Um, is, and it's not the only stakeholder, um, it may not be the most important to everyone, but, but certainly it should be very high on the list. <laughs> Generating value for your shareholders. And if that's, I think if just put simply, if that's not something that's a high priority for, um, for corporate management teams, then I think the question is, should, should it be a publicly traded company? Should it be a publicly traded company or should that management be replaced? Yeah. And so here's the problem, right? The system of lifetime employment has resulted in such an illiquid supply of management talent, right? That even if you are successful at pushing out a CEO or a chairman who is clearly destroying value for the employees and for shareholders, who do you replace him with? If we think about the CEOs who are now running Japanese companies who came from outside the company, there are very few, and most of them have struggled, right? Yeah. Can I, you think of people who have done relatively well or relatively or have had real problems who have come in from outside? I don't know if the answer is always coming in from outside. And every, every situation is going to be different. To me, um, um, uh, going back to this idea of good company, like, a lot of Japanese companies are operationally good companies. They make good products. They, they, they might have good margins, right? They, they pay a lot of attention. They're, they're technocrats. These are, these are people who came up in the company and they are executors. They, they think about their customers and their suppliers, and, um, uh, but they might not think about share price, right? So, um, uh, so maybe the CEO is someone who came from the operational side. Maybe the CFO is someone who could, who could be in charge. Um, I think in a lot of cases, the talent that you want is there. Well, that's Sony, right? The CEO came, was the CFO. I think in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. the talent that, that shareholders want is, is at the company already. Mm -hmm. you, want, you probably want someone to run a company who knows that company, who's, mm -hmm. who has employee loyalty, right? Um, mm -hmm. uh, the talent is probably there. They just need the right framework with which to manage the company. So I've heard arguments even from people at JPX who say that's why independent directors, a majority of independent directors on the boards of Japanese companies is not the right model for Japan. It's because the company has such a um, insular history or such a deep history and such a tightly, it's such a tight community that you bring in outside directors to run the company and you're asking for a disaster. I'm not sure I know how I feel about that. How do you feel about that? I think it's I think it's I think it's case by case. Um, I can't. I don't think you can generalize all Japanese companies any more than you generalize all American, American companies. companies. Yeah, um, fair enough. So so I would say it's probably case by case. And again, I think that's I think that's why that's why I like the way that Japan has gone about this corporate governance reform of really putting it in the hands of shareholders. Right, the government hasn't said either you know X amount of independent directors, uh, you know, or else. Um, in some cases, they, they have, but, but it's usually a pretty low bar. Um, they're saying, we think you should have this many. Mm. It's okay if you don't, but you need to explain to your shareholders why. Mm. And if the shareholders are satisfied with that answer, then, then things will be fine. Yeah. Um, I think it really comes back, I mean, if, if, if a group of, if it's all inside directors and the ROE is 20% and the share price is good, I think everyone's happy. Yeah. Right? It, 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 it's not only, I mean, independent directors is one metric. Right. Um, uh, but some of the best performing companies in the US have 
you know, have, have, all voting rights consolidated to the founders. Right? It, exactly. It, yeah. So it's exactly. not. But but the share prices, but the shares perform well, and the investors right. are happy, and so. Um, or everybody always criticizes Jamie Dimon, right, for being in the position for so long and being chairman and CEO, and yet his institution is doing pretty well yeah. relative to Spear Group. I, I don't know JP Morgan as well, but yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the be. same is true for the UK, which always puts itself forth as a model of corporate governance, right? You know, the preponderance of companies in the UK that have chairman and CEO who are the same person is pretty high. And guess what? They're the best UK companies. So oh. I wonder if it's just, again, as I, you know, I'm, this is not an original thought of mine, but I've heard people say it's really about who the CEO and the chairman are and how much they trust mm -hmm. being open mm -hmm. with other people. Mm -hmm. and if they are open to hearing new ideas or to being challenged and they're strong leaders, like maybe that's the best model. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and what's their track record, right? And right. if, if, if um, again, I think if the chairman and the CEO are the same person and the, the board is composed of all former employees, if, if the company is trading at a, at a fair valuation and um, they're putting shareholder returns you know, near the top of the list, I think shareholders will be happy. I don't think it'll be that much of an issue. Well, you, you raise an important point. I mean, different um, stakeholders, for lack of a better word, or different constituents yeah. have different definitions of success, right? Yeah. And, and, and activism, too. And I, don't, you know, I think the point of activism, the goal of shareholder activists is not to get board directors appointed. No. Right? Shareholder activists run funds, or right. they're investing their own capital, or in some cases, it's a domestic institution. Right? Um, they're investing in a company because they see upside in the assets. Hmm. They see upside in the business. Um, the goal is not to have lower sh cross shareholdings or more independent directors. The goal is to get a higher price for the stuff that the company owns, right? Higher price for a higher return. Right. Yeah. Mm. Higher price or higher return. More a higher payout ratio. Mm. Um, uh, you know, monetize some dormant assets that have been sitting around for a long time. Um, whatever it may be. So, you know, I, I think I think at this point, activists are not so picky on who does that, as long as someone is paying attention and and. And, um, and like I said, getting things done, getting after it, yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to um, turn it back to your, your own situation. Sure. Um, when, when I was coming up with a title for this event, Tim pointed out to me that um, you, know, you, you th tend to think of changes in control uh, as an outright purchase of one company by an investor or another company. But in Japan, this takes many forms, change of control. It could be consolidation of a subsidiary with its parent. It could be a spin-off of that subsidiary. It could be a privatization, a delisting. It could be a strategic buyout. It could be changes to the board. And it could be an MBO. Um, what, what are the most important trends? And how does Japan differ from other markets, if at all, in, in this respect? Where are these changes of control? Um, you know, like there are lots of attempts to put new directors on the board or new, yeah. you know, the, maybe that's not really a change of control. How, you know, what do you see as the most important things of this nature happening? Yeah, so as, as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, the, if you take the typical deep value company in Japan, which is a, a small cap company, um, uh, entrenched management, I think the best owner, and you know, every publicly traded company is a collection of assets, right? So. The best owner for those assets is likely another Japanese corporate. Um, they probably have the highest level of synergies. Um, they probably have an overlapping uh, uh, labor pool. Um, the, the issue is that historically, um, Japanese corporates have been averse to anything hostile or, uh, or unsolicited. And the financiers are not there. Right, the right. Financiers are right. Sure so, so, so now a lot of Japanese companies have the, necessary means to finance the deal themselves or they can issue it uh, issue shares um, but but so there needs to be so there needs to be a catalyst and I think in a lot of cases the catalyst is now and I think this is where activist invest, investors can play the biggest role is highlighting um, highlighting missed opportunities for Japanese corporates right so if, if an activist investor can go out and make a tender offer for a company um, but that's going to be much lower than what the company next door can pay for those assets because there's immediate synergies, right? Uh, immediate, but both in terms of capital market synergies and operational synergies. Um, so I think the role of activist investors can really be 
highlighting uh, places of, of deep valuation discount to the best buyers and, and I don't know, arranging marriages is probably the wrong term, but, but um, causing them to run to, to each other mm -hmm. out of a fear of anything else, mm -hmm. right? The, I think the, there is this historic aversion to, to being taken over by an activist manager or even to private equity funds have kind of been seen as you know, money hungry uh, uh, an entity in, in Japan. And so we talked earlier about the prestige of a, of a, of a public listing. Um, you can maintain a public listing. Um, your employees will probably stick around. Um, I think it's the best answer, and I think it's what will happen most often mm -hmm. in these cases. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that I think that M and A uh, or by any other name take over. I think that's what will happen the most. All right. <coughs> we have about ten minutes. I wanted to reserve some time for Q and A, and uh, I hope I've haven't ignored somebody who was trying to ask a question. I've got tons more questions for for Tim, but. Um, you know, one of the things that I thought people might be interested in is hearing about his own, I hate this word, journey, <laughs> <laughs> from working in a secure family <laughs> office with lots and lots of nice, um, um, you know, support, <laughs> um, to going out on his own uh, and taking, making this bet that the MBO market in Japan will, will continue to expand. Um, so I, he told me he's happy to speak to that if anybody has any questions, but can I just ask if anybody has any questions about anything we've discussed so far? Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for being here. My name is Beijing from China, uh, MBA students. I'm so sorry, can I just ask you to speak up? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I have a question, actually, too. Uh, so other than the policy changes under uh, Abe, other than the policy changes under Abe? Yeah, why? Uh, I guess the valuation has been uh, at a discount for a long time. Then why all of a sudden there's uh, such a huge demand from domestic retail investors other than the policy change? Uh, so that's the first question. Second is that um, I guess uh, for like you mentioned, like the opportunities with uh, small cap companies, like they are more uh, easy to achieve low hanging fruit. Do you think that will become a race with all the capital flowing from foreign companies and domestic companies? Because I guess uh, price will eventually catch up. So do you think this will become a race to pick all the low hanging fruit as soon as possible? And from a, uh, like you mentioned, a lot of companies made a fortune. And how do you compare the risk adjusted reward in Japan market versus other markets? Um, I do think it'll become a race at some point. Um, I think we're still in the very early stages of this market for corporate control. Um, there's a few things that are that are holding it back still from becoming a race. Um, financing is probably the biggest issue. So uh, that's starting to change. Right? Starting to change, but I mean we're talking like one or two deals, right? It was very very early. Um, uh, in order in order to to launch a tender offer in Japan. Uh, before you're even allowed to launch the tender offer, um, you must prove to the regular that you have sufficient cash to close that deal. You have to show a lot of cash up front, right? Um, access to that cash. Um, in the U.S., right, every bank has an LBO desk or some sort of high yield desk. You can go to the banks and they can arrange financing. Um, in Japan, most banks will not finance anything that's unsolicited or hostile. So then you have to go to somewhere else. Japan doesn't have a deep credit market. Doesn't have a deep distress market. Never has. It's all, everything. All the all the debt is bank debt. Right? So um, so what activists are doing now? Either they're big enough to fund the deals themselves, which is you can count on one hand how many investors can do that, um, uh, or they're raising money from overseas, right? And that's where I think that's where I think the U.S. and, and our role as a business is, is most most prevalent, is highlighting this disparity and saying, um, uh, you know, these these investors in Japan need our help. So I do think it'll become a race, but there's some, uh, until the financing is more liquid, um, I, I think that it'll be kind of one off, one by one. Um, your first question was the, the shift in demand from domestic investors. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any uh, stats on domestic participation of, of, in Japanese equities. Is there, is there anything like... Um, voting? No, not voting, just domestic ownership or domestic... Uh, oh, for um, domestic retail investors. I'm not sure if there's any... Um, it's tiny, and it's yeah. been going down like steadily since like 1986 or something. But, but part of the original... And in fact, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. but uh, one of the current prime minister's economic policies is to try to expand the Japanese version of IRA, yeah. right, to get more uh, 
individual household money into the stock market because yeah. it's still the case. It's been for, like Japan's been a value yeah. market for so long. It's also the case that Japanese households that have had more than 50% of their assets in bank deposits yeah. since yeah. when it, since forever. So I think I think that in the, going back to the original onset of Abenomics, one of the original ideas to, to get out of this deflationary cycle was uh, it, it's an old idea. It's been done in the U.S. with the wealth effect, right? So so make stock prices go up so people feel rich and spend money. Um, I think that's still something that that the, the you know the governing powers in Japan hold dear is they want the market to go up for a lot of reasons. One of them being we want our people to feel rich and go spend money and and uh, you know create more uh, higher velocity of capital in Japan. But I, I think Tim's point about um, the in a, in availability of, of finance for takeover bids is is a really important yeah. problem. Um, and my understanding is that one or two Japanese institutions are trying to bend under very specific circumstances. But as Tim says, in just about any other country, all you have to do is pick up the phone and somebody will lend you money right away. And, th and that's frankly why I set this business up, is we thought there was, there's a hole in the market, right? If you're an activist manager in Japan, you want to launch a hostile bid for a company. Um, you now you can call Tim. Can't, well, <laughs> you can't get domestic financing for it. And I thought to myself, well, shouldn't there be a, shouldn't there be a group that's not our only function, right? Um, but, but part of our idea is, if there's a really interesting, compelling opportunity, we should help these managers to raise the, the requisite equity to, to get this deal done, mm -hmm. or to show the regulator that they can do this deal. Mm -hmm. Mr. Katz. Hi, I'm Richard Katz from uh, Toyota Keizai. Um, so if you could talk a bit more about the hostile. Yeah, I'm sorry. Hi, mm -hmm. um, Richard Katz, Toyota Keizai. If you could talk a bit more about these hostile takeovers, uh, just some sense of the pattern of who are the targets, who are the buyers, and what's the, what's the after, in the, in the successful cases, what happens to performance afterwards and, and, and employee acceptance of this new owner? Um, so, just, so, yeah, let me just start by saying we're not, we are not activist investors. Uh, my group does not. Um, register as a shareholder, nor pr make shareholder proposals. Um, the the number of successful, I'll say, unsolicited or hostile transactions is, is very limited. Very small. I think there's a few per year for the past three years. There might be two, right? Yeah. Shinsei and JAG. Yeah. But, you know, so now now H, like you know, HIC was one. Right. Um, uh, yeah. And there, there, so there've been very very few. Um, uh, the flyer says what? Sorry. The flyer said it was. Really growing. It is growing from a base of zero. zero. <laughs> yeah, from a base of zero, uh, which is, and that, that's. I think that is um, that is tectonic. That is huge. That there's even anything happening. Shinsei Bank is a big company. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so Shinsei Bank was, in the fact that it's a bank, um, to me, that's kind of a, a precedent-setting transaction. Um, Murakami took over a, a very famous activist investor in Japan, took over a publicly traded company, which which had never really happened before. Um, uh, there's there's B to B hostile takeovers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, companies. I couldn't tell you what I couldn't tell you about about um, about how uh, employee retention after the deal. I, I I just I just don't know. Um, what I, what I what I can say is that the 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 options to um, uh, to an equity owner uh, after a successful takeover are are so many, so plentiful. There's so many ways to generate value from these companies because they are good companies. As I meant, operationally, a lot of these companies are very good companies, but they have uh, an excess of assets or, or um, uh, uh, a bad capital allocation policy. Um, so, uh, yeah, does that answer your question?